Well, we're in for a, a good day today. Uh, God's got some things in his heart uh, for you. I, I so believe that. Um, uh, we will be back tonight uh, for our glory service. Our Sunday nights have just been um, off, off the hook, um, as they say, okay? Uh, as, as it says in the, in the King James Version, off the flipping chain. Uh, uh, so we'll be back tonight at 6 p.m. Also, uh, I do see some new faces here today. So welcome to Eden. Uh, after this service, I will be in the hallway. So I'd love to meet you, love to shake your hand. Uh, I've got a book for you, okay? It's a, it's a book that I wrote. Um, you know that I wrote it because it's incredibly thin. It could be, could be a booklet, but uh, anyways, um, but it'll, 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 it'll change you. It'll, it's one of the best books, you know, since Pilgrim's Progress. <laughs> I mean, uh, just, <laughs> just kidding. Um, so I'd love to get to meet you, but I'm just super excited today because we're going to be diving into um, uh, the book of Revelation, a, a very wild, very wild chapter. It's the sixth chapter. So perhaps you came here today not really knowing what we would be uh, studying. Guys, today we're going to be studying the four horsemen of the apocalypse. <sighs> yeah. And for that, I brought my big Bible. <laughs> um, this, this is, look, look at, this is the, you can't even buy these anymore. This is the Amplified Classic. All right. Um, it still has the sticker on it, 20% off. Uh, I, think, I think my wife found this on eBay for like $300. It has like, listen, your, your app don't have that kind of smell to it. Anyways, um, so that'll be good. We'll be diving into that. Uh, so if you got your Bibles, uh, turn to Revelation uh, chapter 6. But uh, I want to catch you up on this week and some, some wild stuff that happened this week. So um, this, this whole week, I was hanging out with an F-16 uh, or F-15, who's counting, fighter pilot, okay? So I was with this, this, this fighter pilot, um, and I was with this other guy, uh, and he is the guy that builds all the sets for the, the Chosen uh, TV series. So uh, he builds the sets, and his daughter does all the painting and, and, and work on, on that. So hang out with these two guys. Uh, and then also hanging out with, um, with Troy Brewer, okay? Uh, and then his, his strong right arm, uh, Jerry, and then his boys. We were, um, we were in, so if, if you know Canada, if, if you go east <laughs> and then north, you, there's a place, you'll just have to take my word for it, called Winnipeg. All right. <laughs> now, if you, go to, if, if you fly into Winnipeg, you, you can drive to a place called The Pa. Okay, now, now we are out there, okay? We are out there. And if you just keep driving past the point of no cell phone coverage, okay? You just keep driving. You end up, okay, in the armpit of northern, eastern, I mean, it's not even on the map. You go through the woods, it's kind of like Narnia, okay? A little fawn came out and greeted me with a flute. It was crazy. So uh, anyways, now, this is, this, is, this is wild. I was talking about this in the first service. After the service, I was at the book table meeting guests. Uh, one of the guys that came up to me goes, I am from the paw. Because that's, that's where I was raised. Oh, okay, don't trip. Okay, this is, you're, you're, uh, you're about to after I tell you this. The guy, behind, the visitor behind him, he's from Winnipeg. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. So we're hanging out out there, okay? Um, and I'll, let me tell you more about the book table because this has just been a wild morning. Uh, the, the guy behind him from Winnipeg, uh, it lives in New York City. So he's visiting Seattle this weekend. And I said, uh, well, you know, what do you do? Uh, you know, what do you do in New York? He's like, I'm a, he says, I'm a musician. And I'm performing in Seattle this weekend. I said, that's great. Where are you, where are you playing at? He's a little venue called Jazz Alley. Well, anybody knows me. I, I am just a jazz alley geek, okay? I used, you know, used to spend a lot of money there before I got married. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I grew up playing the piano. I love piano jazz. Anyways, he's the stand-up bass player for, uh, for this, this old-time piano jazz guys performing, uh, you know, in, in, anyways, isn't that it's pretty cool? All right, enough about them. Um, so we were, we were in Canada. We were fishing by day, hunting bear by night. For real. I've never been bear hunting before. In fact, I didn't even know if I was going to get to actually do it. I just went there to kind of hang out with the guys. But this is what they do. They take you out into the middle of the woods, 
dark woods. Even by day, they're dark. They're so dense that like if you got trees in front of you, I, w- I wouldn't be able to see even t- into the third row. Okay, they take you out there. They put you up in a tree and then they leave you. <laughs> and your cell phone doesn't work. You just, all you have is a radio, okay? And you sit up in a tree until it's dark. And then you wait until it's darker <laughs> because they have to pick up all the other hunters. So by the time they get to you, you've been sitting by yourself. Okay, listen, like every, so I did that all, all week, every night sitting up in a tree by myself. I spent about 30 hours in a tree <laughs> inside of this thing, <laughs> inside of my head. <sighs> just like, just Jesus and I, you know. I didn't see a bear the entire week. Okay, listen. Friday night, I'm sitting up in the trees, beautiful day. All of a sudden, it starts to rain and then it starts to pour and then the wind starts blowing. That's pretty normal. I mean, the weather can just change like that. I'm just getting poured on. I've been there all day long. It's about 9.30 at night and I'm like, I'm not gonna get my bear. Okay. Um, 9.45 comes, the rain stops. Not only does the rain stop, the rain stops, the wind stops, everything stops. The forest goes quiet. Listen, the forest isn't quiet. I've heard sounds this last week that you didn't even know existed. I swear there are birds that actually sound like fax machines. Like you're just sitting out there like creation is just doing its thing. That it's just alive, but not at this moment. At this moment, everything just goes silent, like weird silent, like just completely quiet. And, 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 and it's 945. Okay. And I hear a, 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 a branch break behind me. That's not where you want a branch to break. <laughs> Guys, and I'm not making this up. All of a sudden I hear breathing and I hear a grunt. Like, it sounds like this. <sighs> it is, it's right behind my tree and right to the, and, and just to the right. Okay, my rifle's resting because on the ledge and I go to look because I have to because bears climb trees. <laughs> Listen, and they do it quick. Like you might, you might think that they're like just big and fat and no, no, this is for real. My blood pressure is like through the roof. Okay. No, this is like one of the scariest things. I've, even, even without hearing the grunting, just being out there is terrifying. And so I go to look and when I do, all I see is this big fat hairy butt and it takes off running. And it, 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 it sounds like a horse runs, runs away. The woods stay quiet, okay? The woods stay absolutely quiet. And I'm just sitting there, like, actually shaking, okay? Partly because I'm cold and also just because I'm just freaking out, okay? All of a sudden, at 10-ish, okay, 10, 10.05, somewhere in there, front left, a bear, a big black bear comes walking out, just like, doesn't even look at me. So I don't know if it's the same guy or what. Big male, okay, comes out, comes across the trail, uh, turns around and stops. So I did what any good millennial hunter does. I turned on the GoPro. <laughs> if you didn't film it, it didn't happen, right? All right, so I get the camera going. It's attached to my guns. Okay, this whole thing's recorded. Uh, line up the shot, pull the trigger, bam, it takes off running, okay? I hear it run off through the woods. And then I'm just listening, okay? And, and uh, again, all this on footage, okay? All of a sudden I hear, and they do this, okay? And, and, and they sort of bear hunting. Like this, I, this is all new to me, but if you're a bear hunter, you know, you know this story. All of a sudden I hear, <laughs> they, call it, they call it the bear moan of death. It's doing this for like four or five, don't, don't, aw. Oh, these are, <laughs> listen, these are beasts. These are evil beasts. These are, this, this is, these are the monsters of the forest, okay? Okay, I'm the protector of the forest, okay? <laughs> and, and, and then I know, I, listen, I got it. So I, I, uh, I, I get on my, my walkie and I'm like, I got him. And my guide, his name's Sandy. I'll tell you more about him and his family later on. If I forget, remind me, okay? Um, Sandy goes, I said, I got him. And Sandy goes, yeah, I heard it, eh? Listen, San, Sandy is uh, First Nations. Him and his whole family, they run this lodge where we were at. Him and his cousins, 
uncles, brothers, the coolest um, uh, Indian family, just awesome. But they're like, they're old school, man. Now it's, now it's dark, it's late, and he tracks the blood trail at night. We're talking like a drop of blood on a leaf. He tracks that thing out. We find, we find anyways, um, I wasn't gonna do this in this service because we're, we're, stream, we're, we're streaming or whatever, but, um, but you only live once. I wanna, you guys wanna see my bear? Yeah. Hey, go, go and put it up. Look how black his face is. They usually have kind of a lighter nose. No, not him. Like, because the, the mean ones are all just, anyways, isn't that awesome? So pretty cool. All right, so uh, I, I said to Sandy, you guys can take that down. Uh, I said, Sandy goes, he goes, he goes, that was so weird, eh? He goes, it was just raining and windy. He goes, and all of a sudden, everything just went completely still. And I said to myself, oh, I, he goes, I know he's going to get that bear, eh? He goes, and as soon as everything went still, he goes, I heard the shot. He, he goes, I just knew it. I knew you were going to get your bear. Anyways. <laughs> Maybe you're not impressed, but. <laughs> but I am. <laughs> what was it, Grant? No, Troy didn't get one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, probably because there's probably some sort of sin or some sort of thing that he needs to, you know, some, something he needs to work on or process through. But um, yeah, I've, I, I've never seen the righteous forsaken. <laughs> Come on, all right. <laughs> Let's, let's pray. Let's pray. <laughs> Lord, we, we enter into your courts with thanksgiving in our hearts, and we're just, we're so grateful to be a part of your incredible family, and we're so grateful to be able to call you Father. And Lord, we thank you so much for sending your Son to die on a cross for all of our sins, to redeem us, and to bring us into your great and glorious kingdom. Father, I, I, I just thank you so much for Eden, for our leadership here, for, our, for all the, the families that, that make up our, our, our church. Lord, they're so special. This place is so special. I know it's so special to your heart. And Father, I just give you thanks uh, for the honor of getting to be here uh, and getting to pastor here. And Lord, we just, we just give you so much thanks and praise um, for our amazing, incredible spouses. Lord, that you, uh, that, you, that, you were, that you were able to find somebody for me is just amazing. <laughs> Lord, we give you thanks and praise for our children. Lord, that you've blessed us with the most amazing opportunity to steward these incredible world changers. And Lord, we just give you thanks and praise for, for today, this day that you have made. And we just, we do not want to take life for granted. We do not want to take today for granted. And so, Lord, we just, we, just, we just say thank you. We love you. We praise your name. Lord, we ask that as we study your word, th that you would be found in the midst of it. Lord, I pray that as we study your word, that those with misconceptions about who you are, that, th that they would get sorted out and that people would get a true understanding of your character and your nature. And Father, I even pray, Lord, that as we study your word today, that those who are wrestling with sin, with sin would be convicted. Lord, that they would meet Jesus as Savior, saving one. And Father, even as we study one of the freakiest passages in all of the scriptures, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, just a complete nightmare of a scene. <laughs> I pray that your perfect peace would accompany us. And Lord, that as we leave here today, we would leave with a peace that surpasses all understanding. In Jesus' name, everybody in agreement said? Amen. Amen. All right, we're in Romans, we're not in Romans, we're in Revelation. Uh, and we're going through the entire book of Revelation, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, which is unfortunate because it would be nice to be able to skip certain chapters and certain verses, okay? Um, 
Now, listen, if you've ever been a part of a study in the book of Revelation where they chose to do that, that's, that's totally fine. There's different ways that you can study a revelation. You can study it topically by, by different themes. Um, there's a lot of different ways. Um, but for us, okay, um, we're actually going through this whole thing just verse by verse. Okay. Um, th- that makes things very tricky, tricky for us. Because as we're studying this, this, this passage, um, uh, I've, I've been trying to make sense out of it. And I, 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 I've, I've, I've been reading, you know, commentaries and just spending hours in, in study and preparation for this. The reason why it's tricky is that um, you can read four different commentaries and four of them be, be pretty good and convincing. In fact, I uh, studied guys that, that are modern day scholars, friends of mine, and it was like really good, good stuff. I also read the early church fathers. Really good, uh, 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 okay, uh, exegesis and hermeneutic uh, within this text. The problem is I couldn't find any two scholars that came to agreement pertaining to this text. So I'm like, which, like, who, what thinker do I go with? What commentator uh, do I go with? How, how do we, how do we, uh, man, I wrestled with this, with this, so I thought, maybe we'll just skip it. <laughs> no, no, I, did. I, I knew that the Lord was going to help, and I believe that the Lord is going to help us as we, as we do this. Um, uh, uh, but let me just say, I believe that it's possible that you can have um, uh, four different people, and this is fun. How many of you have ever done dream interpretation? Okay, it's, it's really fun to do team interpretation with dreams. And the reason why is that you'll get one dream and you'll get like three or four different people that interpret the dream and four interpretations are prophetic and like really good. It's, it's actually a lot of fun to do dream interpretation as a team. And yet you have four different interpretations of the same dream, but it's really fun because sometimes there's just th- this thing that where they complement each other and it's like a four part harmony. And it just creates this, this kind of this symphonic kind of uh, dynamic that's really, really great. And then there are times, okay, when you have people that are singing together and nobody can carry a tune, okay, and, and you got people that are off on their own little kind of musical journey. There's dissonance there and the trajectory takes you somewhere that's unhealthy, right? So I think it's really important that as we, as we study Revelation and as we study different takes on Revelation, um, that what we're looking at is, 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 are, are they harmonizing? Are these understandings, these applications of this text, are they all kind of harmonizing with the whole context of all the scriptures? Okay, and the trajectory of, the, of whatever theology I'm subscribing to, is it a positive and redemptive, um, and, and, and I'm gonna say, is it a victorious trajectory? Okay, and if so, I think it, it can be quite fruitful. With that being said, uh, our study of this text today may be different than what you have studied uh, within, this, within this text. I think what's going to be helpful is when we look at the historical context of this passage, I think that's going to be really helpful for all of us. Because when you look at history, it's, it's kind of hard to debate history. That, that's where everybody is in agreement. The other thing that I want you to remember is that the book of Revelation was written to the first century church, but for us. So I'll say it again. It was written to them for us. This was a persecuted church, and this was a church going through massive political um, upheaval, massive religious persecution, okay? But also, this is a church that's about to go through one of the most violent, destructive wars that the earth had ever seen up to that point. So we'll kind of talk about that. Um, As you remember that, this book of Revelation would have been such a tremendous gift to the early church because it is letting them know of what's about to take place, but it is positioning Jesus, okay, in his victorious nature and status, and it is showing It is showing the response of Jesus to the upheaval and to the injustice, and it shows what Jesus is going to do as a response. And that is, that's incredibly satisfying. You know, when you're going through a hard time and somebody comes up to you and says, listen, man, it's all going to be okay. uh, Sometimes that kind of comfort isn't actually all that helpful. You know, when just somebody says, it's going to be okay. 
Okay, sometimes that, that's not, that's, and, and, that, and that's not what Jesus does in the book of Revelation. What Jesus does in this book is it says, it's, it's not, it's not going to be okay. This is, this is going to be, this is going to be tough. This is going to be tragic. Most of you are going to lose your lives. But let me show you, let me show you the big picture. Let me show you the, 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 the heavenly eternal story. And let me show you your significance in the midst of what I am doing. And let me show you how this whole thing ends. And that, that kind of truth, that kind of revealing of truth, that is absolutely incredible because it shows that their suffering is not in vain. It shows that their suffering is a part of an incredible, epic, eternal story called the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that's what we're going to be looking at um, today. Now, at, before we get to Revelation 6, let me set it up. In Revelation 5, that's where we saw the, the throne room. And in the throne room, there is a scroll. And the big question is, who is worthy to receive this scroll? Who is worthy to open this, this scroll? And John looks and he sees that there was no one worthy to receive this, this scroll. And then all of a sudden, he hears a proclamation, and the proclamation is, behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. Check it out. He turns to see the lion, okay? And when he turns to see the lion, he sees a lamb. And not only is it a lamb, the, the word there for lamb can be translated baby lamb, little lambkin. So check it out. Behold the, the, the lion of the tribe of Judah. You're turning, just imagine it, to see a massive, mighty lion. And when he turns, he sees a baby lamb. And not only a baby lamb, it's a lamb that's been slain. Fascinating. Okay, And the, the lamb is worthy to receive the scroll. Now, I believe that this scroll, everybody says, what, wow, this scroll, what is this scroll? This scroll is, what does it say? Surely we will never know what the, only the lamb is worthy to, to read the scroll. What, what is this scroll? Guys, it's the lamb's scroll. It's the story of the lamb. This isn't just the story of the lamb as recorded in the gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. This is the eternal story of the living word that was and is and is to come. I believe that the scroll is the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of testimony. Paul would say that, that he is the author and perfecter of our faith, that we are the living, the, the, it can actually, out of Greek, can be translated, that we are the living poetry of Christ Jesus. Uh, that means that the storyline or record of your life is a scroll in and of itself that's been authored by the Lord himself. It's fascinating because as we study this, we'll, we'll read more about the book of the Lamb. And one of the things that you're going to see is that your record and testimony is contained within the eternal testimony of Christ Jesus. Think about that. You have a chapter in the book. And not just a chapter, but a, a very, that, the Bible says that before the formation of all things, he knew you, he knew you intimately. That means that you're not random, you're not, you're not an accident. That means that you find yourself being written into a very important part of history. And not just the history of the earth, the actual, the, the history of the cosmos. You are a part of the eternal scroll that begins before the beginning. That begins, and this is what's so mind-blowing. Uh, you can't just take the book of Revelation and start applying it to various temporal Greek timelines. Re why? Because yes, he's the slain lamb. He's also the sacrificial priest. That before, he was slain before the formations of the world. So, the lamb receives the scroll. When he looks at the scroll, there are seven seals. The seals themselves are not the content. The seals, it's like that wax seal on the scroll that protects the scroll. So it's, it's like a classified document, yeah, uh, for your eyes only. So this is a scroll for the lamb, the lamb's scroll. It's for his eyes only, and it's being protected by seven seals. Today, uh, 
Revelation 6, we're going to separate into two weeks. The first week today, we're going to look at the first four seals that are opened, okay? This scroll is going to be opened, okay? Um, the testimony of Jesus, the record of the, of, of the gospel is going to be opened. Why? It has to be. Why? The only way into the kingdom is to be born again, okay? And he did not just die for people. Why? Because everything was impacted by the fall. Everything was impacted. Everything, all of the cosmos, the, the order, the, the justice of the cosmos was violated by sin. And what was released into the heavenly places upon not just the fall of mankind, there are, uh, there are actually five insurrections or five rebellions, heavenly rebellions that take place in the Old Testament. So um, as we get into this, uh, D disclaimer, like little warning here. Um, I am not a professional. Okay, I am. I am not an expert. I am. I am. I am learning. Okay, and one of the things I love about the Word of God is when we study the Word of God, it, it humbles us. Okay, so I I want to approach the text with as as much humility as possible as possible. And here's the other thing that as we dive into this, I'm gonna tell you some things that I, that I think I know, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to include you into some things that I'm, that I'm learning and some things that I'm very curious about and, and some things that are actually like exciting me. There, there are some things that I feel like I'm, I'm just kind of scratching the surface on. So I'm going to invite you into that. Okay. And, and we're, we're going to struggle with it a little bit. And for some of you, this is going to be very different than maybe your traditional uh, approach um, to this text. Uh, but I believe that it'll be good, redemptive. It'll help us in a victorious trajectory for where Jesus is taking us um, as Eden, okay? All right, we're, are you guys ready to look at the breaking of the, of the seals? Let's take a look, guys. Revelation, Revelation 6. It says, uh, Then I saw as the Lamb broke open one of the seven seals, and as if in a voice of thunder... I heard one of the four living creatures calling out, come. And I looked and saw a white horse whose rider carried a bow, all right? So a white horse, the horse has a rider, the rider has a bow, and a crown was given him, and he rode forth conquering and to conquer. And when he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature call out, come. And look at this, another horse came out, the first one is right, white. The second horse is flaming red. And its rider was empowered to take the peace from the earth. Okay? So that men slaughtered one another, and he was given a huge sword. So we have a white horse and a rider. We have a red horse and a rider. Uh, verse 5. When he broke open the third seal, I heard the third living creature call out, Come and look. And I saw, and behold, Look, at the third horse is a black horse. And in his hand, the rider had a pair of scales and a balance. And I heard what seemed to be a voice from the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius, which is a whole day's wages, way too much to pay for wheat, okay? Three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. Verse 7. When the lamb broke open the fourth seal, I heard the fourth living creature call out, come. So I looked and behold, an ashy pale horse, black and blue, as if made by bruising. And its rider's name was Death and Hades. The realm of the dead followed him closely and they were given authority and power over a fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword and with famine and with plague and with the wild beast of the earth. All right. So we see four horses, okay? And what we see are four plagues that are released onto the earth. Plagues, that's interesting. What do you think of when you think of plagues? You think of Moses. Moses going to Pharaoh saying, let my people Go. So we see God releasing plagues onto the earth for the purpose of liberation. 
The Jewish readers of this text, when they hear this letter from Jesus coming to them and the breaking of these, of these seals, um, they would immediately think of Jesus. They would think of what Jesus refers to as end times and birth pains. So there are end times and there are birth pains. And there had to be an end time in order for there to be a new birth. Again, the application here is that there is coming an epoch moment. There is coming a moment that is so significant that it's going to change the way that time is measured before Christ and after Christ. And Revelation is going to give us a revelation of what took place in the heavenly realms at the moment that Jesus died. At the moment that he said, it is finished, which was what? The end. So in Matthew 24 and in Mark 13, verses 7 and 8, Jesus says, the end is coming. Okay? Don't be bummed out. Why? Because with the end comes a new beginning. What's the new beginning? Born again. What's Jesus talking about? He's not talking about the end of the earth. He's actually talking about everything, all things being born again through his death, burial, and resurrection. All right. Perhaps you didn't know that's what Revelation was about. Perhaps you didn't know that Revelation is a revelation of Jesus the Christ and what took place in the heavenly realms when Jesus was born. So we're going to get to that. When you read the book of Revelation, it gives you the spiritual heavenly account of the violent war that took place when Jesus was born. It, so when we study Revelation, so many times we want to take everything that we're reading and say, that, that's, that's to come. This is to come. Okay? Um, for example, here in Ma Mark 13, Jesus says, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. This is what Jesus says. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, don't be alarmed. Why? That's not the end. That's the birth pains. He says, for nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines, but these are just, this is what Jesus says, these are just the beginnings of the birth pains. Why? Because what's the end? The end is when Jesus says, it is finished. That is when the seals are broken. That is when the scroll is undone. And that is when the testimony of Jesus begins to swallow up the record of corruption and the glorious gospel of the Lamb is unrolled, swallowing up all of the cosmos into the good news of the supremacy and centrality of the Lamb that was slain. Isn't it incredible when we make this about him and not about us? But don't worry, my friends. Uh, we find ourselves in, in Revelation. The church has such a significant uh, part to play um, within the book. Now, um, the thing about this is what we can all agree on is history. What we wrestle with is the prophetic application as taking Revelation and putting it in the future. Uh, for example, I was, I was looking at a whole bunch of uh, prophetic interpretations of Revelation, you know, going from the 80s up to the present, where we take the four horsemen of the apocalypse and we begin to attach the modern day implication to these passages. So what do we have? We've got war. We've got conquest. That's the first horse. Okay. The second horse is uh, bloodshed. Okay. The third horse is uh, famine. Okay. Uh, and and uh, in great, uh, great inflation. And the final horse is, is death. All right. So the problem with taking these things and putting them on a, on a timeline is, let's say that with our, our modern day saying, hey, this is to come, is that if this is your expectation, your expectation biblically is calamity, then whenever things get tough, you'll try to take the toughness of that moment and say, I knew this was going to happen. And not only will you say that, but you'll say, biblically, it's going to get worse. 
And not only will you say that, but you'll say it'll get worse and worse and worse, and then we'll try to put ourselves into three different camps. The first camp will say, I knew this was gonna happen, but don't worry, it won't get any worse until we get out of here. The rapture is our hope. So things are gonna get bad. This is just birth pains. Don't worry, why? He's getting us out of here, and we won't have to be here for any suffering. Well, then how do you deal with suffering? When it doesn't just rain, it pours. The nations are raging and warring, and you're there thinking, I thought the rapture was supposed to happen by now. Okay, or you put yourself in a, in a second camp that says, oh, we'll experience some of the suffering, but we won't e- experience most of the suffering, most of the tribulation, because somewhere in the middle, God's going to get us out of here. Okay? Or you say, no, we're going to go through all of the suffering, all of the calamity. We'll be here for every part of it. Okay? And then, once we have survived, then he'll get us out of here. Okay? Three different camps. But when you read the book of Revelation, the church never goes up. We'll never hit that verse. When you read the book, the church doesn't go up. Heaven comes down. So, you know, I think, you know, let's look um, at the historical context of the church that receives this word and why this would have been such an encouraging word for the church. Okay, the white horse, okay? This symbolizes conquest. Through what? Through military might. White horse, you've got an archer on a horse. He's got a bow. He's got a crown. Rome used white horses, yes, but not in warfare. So Rome would never have a combat soldier on a white horse. Why? Rome only used white horses after the war. A weapon is no longer needed, and the white horse is symbolic of victory. Okay? Also, uh, the Romans never put archers on white horses. So uh, here is this letter. It's a white horse. What do we see? We see a white, okay, horse with an archer on the horse, the crown, meaning victory. Here you have Rome, the superpower that we're going to be reading a lot about in Revelation, receiving this letter that a white horse, archer, there's only one army that this would have spoken of, and that's the Parthians the one army that had the ability to really bum out Rome. It's debatable. Could they actually overthrow Rome? Who knows? This would strike fear into the heart of any Roman that would read that from heaven is being released an army that looks like one of our enemies. But there's also a prophetic application to this text in that He's riding a white horse. In that, he's carrying a weapon. In that, he's wearing a crown. We see a victorious conqueror. So this speaks to a very natural application, okay, the threat of war. It also speaks prophetically of Christ the King being released from heaven on behalf of his people. And if you're a friend of God, hallelujah, okay? If you're an enemy of God, it's a bad day for you. Why? The plagues are coming. The plagues are coming to bring forth liberation. God has heard the cries of his people. The lamb is releasing a response to the injustice, to the corruption that has had jurisdiction on the earth up to the point of the cross. All right, the second horse is the red horse. This is significant of bloodshed, okay? Bloodshed, violence, war, Um, battles, the shedding of blood, okay? The generation that heard from Jesus about the birth pains and the end is the same generation that received the letter, okay, from, from John, received this letter. They are hearing the lamb is releasing a red horse and rider. With it is coming bloodshed. A battle in the likes that the earth had never seen up to this moment. Uh, in, the day, in, in the weeks ahead, I'll actually give you more context for AD 70 and the Jewish-Roman War, one of the most violent, tragic wars that took place in that known world. It led to the fall of Jerusalem, the total destruction of the temple, 
okay? And so um, this is a prophetic warning to the church that the end is not only coming, okay, uh, 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 for, for Christ in, in this new beginning. Um, the, the end is coming for the whole religious system. That this moment is, is, is such an epoch moment that these, these pillars of your religious tradition are not, are, that are there today will not be there tomorrow. The, the second horse, okay? The gen, think about this. The generation that heard these things was the generation that would see the fulfillment of these things. The third horse was the horse of famine Okay, and inflation. Following AD 70, and there was tremendous starvation that took place. The, this word was fulfilled uh, word for word as to how much it would cost. A day's wages just to buy um, wheat. Okay, the pale horse, the horse of death and pestilence. It's everything that this generation saw. Um, think about this for a second. Theologically, we could be waiting for a tribulation that the early church already experienced. Theologically, we could be waiting for something that is absolutely horrible. And if, and if you are waiting for something that is absolutely horrible, how are you gonna position yourself? You're gonna move out of the cities, you're gonna move out into the boonies, you're gonna get yourself bunkers, you're gonna buy guns, ammo, lots of top ramen, Lots of bottled water. Listen, be prepared for be prepared for an earthquake. But I know I know many many people that have completely stepped out of any sort of social integration because of bad theology that has framed out a trajectory of doom and gloom and despair. When that was never the purpose of this book, the purpose of this book was to activate the church to see the centrality of Christ, to see the supremacy of Christ, and to send them out into every city and every nation. I'll tell you what, the, the early church wasn't looking to escape. The early church was looking to be sure that every person heard the glorious and good message of worthy is the lamb that was slain. Okay. Now, think about this for a second, because uh, this happens in every generation. If we take the four horses and we begin to apply this to our generation, and this was happening, and this is all, this is all we're all learning, okay? We're all, we're all in process. But we say, okay, so we have the second horse, the horse of bloodshed, okay? Uh, we've got the, the fourth horse, uh, which is death, pestilence, is disease. All right, so all of a sudden, here we are in 2020. And you're saying, what the heck is going on? Okay, I can't buy or purchase things unless I can, unless I can show a mark <laughs> in order to buy and sell. Okay, I can't go to a restaurant okay, unless, I, unless I receive a shot. So there was a lot of talk, wasn't there, about the, 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 about the thing, okay, we're, we are streaming, about the thing being the mark of the beast. Okay, and, and what do we have here? We have the fourth horse. We are in the era of the fourth horse, the era of death and pestilence, okay? Uh, COVID, okay? Followed by the third horse. So yeah, we get the, the, the horses in, into a different kind of alignment. What's the third horse? Bide inflation. <laughs> right? So it's, listen, it's a day's wage just to get a number four at McDonald's. You're like, I knew this day was gonna come. It's right here. But hey, what about my grandparents' generation? What about World War II? You know, what about, what about Adolf Hitler? What about the massacre of the Jews? I, I think, you know, here's the thing. Every, every generation um, has their own wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes. Every generation experiences famine. And um, many times, every generation says, this is the book of Revelation. This is the first horse. This is the second horse. This is the third horse. I, I'm sorry, but none of our present day horses can really compete, right, with what took place through Adolf Hitler and the horrible atrocities of what took place there. If any generation could say, no, this is the four horses of the apocalypse, okay, it would have been one of the greatest generations that's ever lived, um, the World War II generation. Yeah, the builders, yeah? 
And yet, I think uh, Harold Eberly does an incredible job looking at Matthew 24, lining that up with World War II, and showing how, um, how they don't line up. But if you look at what took place at AD 70 and what the early church experienced, every one of the details can be checked off by what the early church experienced. Okay. Something is taking place here in, in, in this text. Something is taking place with the breaking of these four seals. Something is taking place here with the unrolling of the testimony of Jesus. Okay? And you have to remember that the testimony of Jesus began before Genesis chapter 1, and it continues beyond the end of Revelation. Um, something took place here uh, in, the, in the heavens where there was a, 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 great, a great battle, okay? Um, a, a great battle for the earth. And it all, it, it just reminds me so much of what we were studying in Genesis. Why? Because a lot of us were taught that in the beginning was a garden. And one of the things that we learned was Eden wasn't a garden. Eden was a temple. And the temple had a garden. Well, one of the things that we learned was that Eden was the place of convergence between the heavens and the earth. We were never created to be a duplex. When Jesus said, pray this way, uh, let it be on earth as it is in heaven. Why? That was the original prototype. One of the things that we learned was with the first fall, with the fall of, of humanity, the rebellion against God, also was the fall of the Nakash, the luminescent one, where we get the name Lucifer. Okay? And we see there that uh, Lucifer gets cast down into the realm of the, of the dead, into, into Sheol. Okay? And one of the things that we learned was that up until that point, you have the divine council in Eden. Okay? You have the sons of God, if you will. That led up to, remember Genesis chapter 6? The sons of God are, uh, are, are cast down, okay? And the sons of God uh, come into union um, with, with, the, with the daughters of man. Uh, and all of a sudden we have the Nephilim. We have this, this hybrid um, uh, race uh, that, that is so demonic it, it, that, that, that God sends a flood uh, through, through Noah. Fascinating, isn't it? That you have the fallen sons of God that are about to be replaced by the true sons. And what we see is that God is going to use his true sons, the new breed, if you will, the ecclesia, the church, at his, as his catalyzing agency by which he is going to displace heavenly rulers and principalities and powers that were given jurisdiction at the fall of Babel. Uh, very interesting. We studied the letters to the seven churches. And like I said, I'm sorry if, if this is a lot. Listen, this isn't like, this isn't 10 ways to lose weight or three ways to get a date. If you're used to a church where it's hip, I mean, this is just, this is just some very dense steak today and your butter knife just isn't gonna cut it but it's important. It, it, it's, it's very important. Why? Because if you look at every flag, uh, especially in, 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 in you go to various nations, they will put their deities on their flags. You go to Europe and it'll, they'll, they'll have dragons. Okay, those, those are bad dragons. Okay, the Europeans don't like dragons. And yet it's a ruling principality over, you go to Wales, you'll see their principality. That is a living principality and power in a heavenly place that the book of Deuteronomy says was given power. Okay, you go to China and those are, the, the Chinese, they love their dragons, okay? So you go, to the, you go to Asia, good dragons. You go to Europe, bad dragons. Principalities, powers, okay? Um, heavenly things that fell and were given legal jurisdiction up until the point that Jesus died on the cross. And this is what we're going to be, and this is all in Revelation. We're going to be reading about dragons. We're going to re be reading about principalities, powers. We're going to be reading about earthly powers, earthly forms of government. And this is such a big deal. Why? Because we're going to see that when Jesus died, these principalities and powers remained. They were not displaced. Yet, Jesus took the keys Jesus took the power and the authority, and at that point, the rulership of the earth changed. 
the lamb now has legal jurisdiction over the earth that he executes his authority, his wills and ways through his ecclesia, the bride, the church. Meaning we are the body of Christ. Up until the point of the crucifixion, we would have to function underneath legal powers, principalities, demonic things in the heavenly places. After the crucifixion of Christ, okay, with the displacement of final of authority over, 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 over the earth from these things, we all of a sudden are given authority on the earth in him, meaning that we no longer have to shout at the heavens from the earth trying to pull things down. Why? We are now seated with Christ Jesus in heavenly places. He is the king above all kings. There are other kings. And these other kings still have authority but they don't have authority over you. You're a part of a new authority. You're part of a, it's not a new authority. You're part of a higher authority. You're part of a higher authority that paid a tremendous price to get the power back to give it over to the sons of God. That is why, listen, that is why all creation groans and waits for the revealing of the sons of God, which are not the fallen deities in Genesis 6. It is you and I, the redeemed. So let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Now here we are, 2024, okay, on the earth, okay, living our lives underneath principalities and powers, cr crazy creepy things in heavenly places. And yet we have power over them, but we have to live under them. And that provides a tremendous tension. And in this tension, there is a tremendous battle and for the church, part of it is a battle of our perspective. Because if we will have a righteous, redeemed, new creation perspective, we will not be intimidated by these lions and bears and giants. No, we will charge after them and we will slay them so that the next generation can pick up where we left off. But if we have an escapist mentality or an avoidance mentality, if we have a theology that just says, no, everything's just going to get worse and worse and worse and we are not invited into this gospel message, okay, um, then what will happen is Goliath will be waiting for our sons and our daughters. And I am saying when you read the book of Revelation, it is going to give us a theology. It's going to give us a picture for the role of the church and how we are to function on the earth until the great and glorious day comes when we say, come Lord Jesus, come. And he comes, okay, to judge, okay, uh, 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 sin, sickness, you know, he comes to judge Satan and, and all of his comrades and throws him into the lake of fire. Hallelujah. And then what will we do? We with Christ will judge angels. And now you, now you know why we will judge angels. Why? Because there have been a significant number of angels that have fallen and are doing things that are not a part of, big word here, the kingdom. This scroll of the Lamb is not just a scroll unto personal salvation. This is the, the, the scroll of the Lamb is the blueprint of the good news of the kingdom. This is the message of the kingdom. And for that reason, we go into cities and nations proactively as a people, as a church. We're going to be doing a bunch of stuff next year. You're going to be doing a, a bunch of stuff. We're going to be sending, sending y'all everywhere. And what are you going to do? You are going to preach the good news of the, of the kingdom. You're going to say, repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. People are going to be awakened to their identity and destiny in the lamb that was slain. And we're going to pull people into, into the testimony of Jesus, which is this. Don't, don't expect everything just to, yeah, things are going to be bad. Things are going to be crazy. Why? There are wicked things in power. There are wicked people in power. But for this reason, when, when something hits the news, don't say, oh, that's, that's the third horse. When something hits the news, don't say, oh, that's, that's the second horse. 
We, we, maybe we said that about COVID, okay? Oh, this is, this is the horse of disease and, and death. But, but we all know now that the China flu wasn't exactly one of the horsemen of the apocalypse. It was a manipulative scheme from powerful people to exploit cities and nations for economic value and for power. I think, we, I think we'd all agree we got played, okay? And so for that reason, okay, for that reason, we stick to the word, we stick to the lamb, and we stick to the role of the church, and we, and we wake up to the reality that the church has to be far more than just Sunday morning services. And the church has to be a deputized pe uh, uh, people that are walking with the spirit of, of reconciliation, that are, that are understanding that we serve a God who releases the horsemen. We serve a God of liberation. We serve a God of justice. We serve a God of restoration. When we read the four horsemen, what do we see? We see Yahweh, okay, a releasing through the sun, through the lamb, okay, the four horsemen for the cause of liberation, releasing the plagues. This is God saying, let my people go. This is God saying, let the cosmos go. This is God saying, let all of creation be redeemed through the blood of the lamb that was slain. This is God saying, I'm taking back everything, the restoration of all things. What is this? The four horsemen of the apocalypse. It's justice, okay? And justice is the judgment of God, and the judgments of God bring the justice of God. And what's that? It's making things right. It's enough is enough, okay? What is the four horsemen of the apocalypse, these, these plagues? It is God who so loved the world that he has made a covenant promise to restore everything that the devil has wrought havoc on for the last few a thousand years. And what does this tell us? This tells us that, and Andrea knows that I'm wrestling, you know, and learning and, you know, and, and I'm, I'm including you into that, but if, if you're gonna go along and just trust the science, okay? Just trust the science. They'll tell you that you are in an infinite universe a universe that is constantly expanding. And somewhere in the middle of that infinite, ever-expanding universe is a speck of dust. And if you zoom in on that speck of dust, you will find a spinning rock spinning out in the middle of the universe, insignificant, okay? Just, it's, it's an ever-expanding, okay? And if you zoom in on that spinning rock, you will find a bunch of ants thinking that they are important. But in light of the universe, the earth is nothing. In light of the universe, you are nothing. In light of the earth, you know, in light of science, okay? And yet that is not the storyline of the scriptures. The storyline of the scriptures makes the earth central to God's kingdom project and makes humanity central to the scroll of the lamb. It places, and so uh, point being is this. I wonder if a lot of information and a lot of data that were being sold maybe isn't true. And maybe what we need to do is we need to say the word of God is true. And the word of God says that in all, you know, <laughs> maybe perhaps the cosmos is, isn't even as big as what they told us. And maybe we are seated right in the center of it. And maybe God's whole entire kingdom project has everything to do with his glorious church redeeming everything that the enemy has wrought havoc on. And I got good news for you. You can skip ahead at any time, go right to the very end of the book, get to the very end of all of this stuff, all of this war and dragons and, and horrors. <laughs> Go right to the very end of the book. Guess what? We win. We win. And we will rule and reign with Yeshua in the new Eden on the earth. Hallelujah. Good times. 
you get to wrestle with it. Good news is you got the internet and you don't have to go to libraries anymore. You can study it out. Let's study the scriptures. Let's find Jesus in the scriptures. Let's find the role of the, of the church in this, and let's see this incredible heavenly battle for the revelation of the Christ and the, revela and the revelation of his bride. All right, let me just tell you my, my story real quick. So we're up in Canada, this, this family of, of First Nations people, it, these Indian people, real close-knit family. And one of, the, one of the brothers, older guy, his name is James, and James just found out that he has uh, bone cancer. Uh, it's pretty, pretty significant, and he's got a lot of pain. So throughout the week, he was just kind of, he was holding his back. So um, towards the end of our trip, it was actually Friday, the same day that I got, that I got my bear. And James was standing there, just standing there right, right in front of me. And so I said, hey, James, I, I hear that you've got some health challenges, some things that you're, that you're facing. And he says, yeah. And I said, um, I said uh, hey, could we, could we pray for you? And he goes, uh, okay. So Troy, Troy was there and, and I was there. And so we, we got up, we came around him. And I just said to him real quick, and you could probably guess what I said. I said, hey, real quick, before we pray for you, let me just tell you, good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. And, you know, it, the family was there, and they were all, everybody was, everybody was listening because they love they loved their brother so much, and they all see the amount of pain uh, that he's in. So everybody just was just paying, paying attention. So I just talked to everybody. I said, you know, what we all have in common is that we've all sinned, we've all done some stuff. And the Bible says, and this was kind of hard to say, but I said, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is life. And the Bible says that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I said, and you're a whosoever, you know, so am I. So if you believe in your heart, confess you with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, he'll, he'll save you, forgive you of all your sins. And I said, all right, let's pray. So Troy began to pray and, and, and I began to pray and, and you could just feel the presence of the Lord. And, 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 um, and now the family, they're, they're crying as and the presence of the Lord was just, just there. And when we were done, I said, hey, James, what do you feel? And he goes, I can feel fire in my back. He didn't say fire. He said, I can feel heat in my back. And I said, that's Jesus. He said, James, Jesus loves you so much. I said, you know, we're gonna have to leave eventually here but you can, you can receive Jesus and he'll never leave you, he'll never forsake you. I said, can I pray with you a prayer of salvation? We could invite Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. He goes, yeah, I'd like to do that. I said, um, have you ever done that before? He goes, no, I've never done it before. So then I said to the family members that were there, I said, would you guys like to do this too? <laughs> and they said, yeah, we would. So we got the family together. And they all, they all prayed the prayer of salvation. Jesus, I believe in my heart. And <laughs> And then when we were done praying, he goes, I feel something now. I said, what do you feel? He goes, I feel like pins and needles going from my toes up into my back. I was like, hallelujah, come on. Jesus is touching you. So then later on that day, his brother Gary I'm going down to the boat and Gary goes, Darren, come here. I, 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 I go over there. He goes, he goes, I got to tell you, eh? He goes, when I woke up this morning, I felt like, <laughs> and he goes, but after we prayed together, I feel amazing now. He goes, this is my favorite part. He goes, that stuff is better than magic, eh? <laughs> so he said it, that, that stuff's better than magic. A. Isn't that awesome? So my guide, he's the, he's the older brother. He wasn't, he wasn't there. But the family, I, I'm assuming that they must have talked or something because it, like, it was like my guide knew, knew something because he just began to open up and on, on the way out. And even on the way back, uh, he started talking about, we need, to, we need to study the Bible and we need to, you know, we need to gather as a family. And their only history for Christianity is Catholicism. And that's a, that's a whole story. They lost a bunch of their property to the Catholic Church. And so I got to teach him about the priesthood of believers. 
that we are all a part of the priesthood and that, that he can lead his own family. So he was the, he was the guy that, that didn't get to pray with us, but he just began talking about his desire to bring the family together. And I told him, you can be a priest to your family. And at the end of the night, he, he said to me, he goes, Darren, you've given me a lot of things to think about. Anyways, listen, Jesus, I mean, I love this family. This family is just the cool. If you could hear their story, it's such an incredible story. But Jesus loves that, that family. Let, let's, let's remember that. Let's remember James in prayer. I believe that we're going to see a doctor verified cancer healing in, in his life. Come on. Let's stand together. Listen, Jesus loves James. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves your family so much. Um, even as we're studying this, this letter together, I, I pray that you see the, the battle, the, the battle for the kingdom of God, the battle for our salvation, the battle for our reconciliation, the battle for our adoption. And, and, and when you look at this, it's, it's, it's a love war that he goes to war because of his great love for his people, his great love for humanity. Jesus said this, for God so loved the world. And he was talking about you. And I'll tell you this morning what I told James. Good people don't go to heaven. You can't spend your whole life trying to be a good person. My encouragement to you would be to tap out this morning. Stop trying to change yourself and just give yourself to Jesus. Just say, Jesus, I need a savior. Jesus, I need a friend. Jesus, I need your spirit. Jesus, I need the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to lead you in a prayer today, just like I, I got to lead that awesome family. And we're just going to all pray it together. Um, and, and let's just do it boldly. Let, let's come before the Lord with faith. You might not have a lot of faith. That's all right. The Bible says you only need the faith the size of a little tiny mustard seed. So just out loud, just say, Jesus, I believe in my heart. I confess with my mouth. I believe you died on a cross for my sins. I believe you rose from death on the third day. I believe that you are seated at the right hand of the Father where you are interceding for me. I respond this morning. I will stop trying to be my own savior. I'll stop trying to be my own fixer. I'll stop trying to be my own helper. Jesus, you be my savior. Lead me to my Father. Give me the Holy Spirit. Just hold out your hands. Just say by faith, hallelujah, I receive my helper, the Holy Spirit. Jesus, come right now. Come like a wave. I pray, I pray that, that, that you would break right now the power of sin, the power of death, the power of shame. Right now, it'd be broken. Right now, right now, right now. Right now, not tomorrow, not tonight, right here, right now. I declare right now, all fear come off of you right now. Even the fear of death for those that are wrestling with a diagnosis of cancer. We just say cancer off of you, out of you right now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We curse that thing right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. And Father, I pray that for those who have been intimidated <laughs> by maybe a, an, an, an enemy from inside, from inside the gates, I pray for those who have been intimidated by an enemy from outside the gates. Father, I pray that people would make up their mind today not to run away from the giant, but to run towards the giant and to slay that giant so that our children and our children's children can live in victory and freedom. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen. Hey, real quick, this is cool. In the first service, we had, we had people uh, make Jesus their Lord and Savior, and we got to pray with them. It was so, it was so awesome. Um, if you prayed that prayer today, if you made Jesus the Lord of your life, uh, do me a big favor, just be super like bold and just wave your hand for like five seconds so I can see it. Just, just, just do this or something. Just wave at me real high. Don't be shy. All right, God bless you. Or you can do it kind of low. <laughs> wait, wave at me real high. I, today I made Jesus my savior. Today I tapped out so he could tap in. Wave at me real high. Okay, awesome. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. 
Who else, who else today? You said today, today's the day I'm making Jesus the Lord, Lord of my life. Just wave at me real high. Just do this. Okay, awesome. Awesome, awesome. I'm rejoicing in that. Hallelujah. I want to welcome you into the family of God. Listen, listen to me. You're not an outsider. You're an insider. You belong in the kingdom for such a time as this. The old is done. The new has come. Expect new things, better things, God's ways. Amen? All right, hey, can, I, can our prayer ministry team come? If you need prayer for anything today, you need prayer for healing, you need encouragement, maybe you gave your life to Jesus, uh, please come, don't, don't leave, okay? Please come on, on, on up here. We want to pray for you. We want to bless you. We want to prophesy over you. Otherwise, if you're new, I'll see you out in the hallway. I got a book for you. Love you. See you tonight.